Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mr. <coughs> <coughs> this is Europe, and here's Switzerland. Now, come on, let's go, shall we? Soaring mountains, verdant valleys, pristine lakes, bored looking cows. Switzerland is among the most beautiful places in the world, but the first inhabitants were not looking for pleasant scenery, at least I don't think so, eking out as they did a frosty hunter's living in the mists of ice coated cliffs. By Neolithic times, the people had forsaken their caves and taken up farming and dwelling in small villages of longhouses. In the various Bronze Age cultures that followed, technology improved and the population became more skilled in craftsmanship and the land became home to Celtic culture. Tribes of Celts lived over much of Europe and in Switzerland the chief tribe was the Helvetii. These Helvetii apparently decided to leave their land and go west to conquer Gaul, but the Romans under Julius Caesar were like nope and they defeated the Helvetii and themselves conquered Gaul. Rome ruled the Swiss lands for hundreds of years, and it was peaceful and prosperous. It was in Roman times too that the Christian faith entered the region, a faith the Germanic conquerors would also adopt, for as Rome fell, the German tribes of the Alemanni and Burgundians took over Switzerland. Germanic rule was solidified after it was conquered by the Franks, and later became part of the German Holy Roman Empire. Now back in these times, there was no single state known as Switzerland, rather the land was split into various communities and townships called cantons. But in 1291, three cantons forged closer ties for reasons of trade and defense. Defense, you say? Against what? Well, for quite some time, the Swiss regions had been granted a special status by the Hohenstaufen emperors and were allowed considerable autonomy. But when the Austrian Habsburgs began to rise in power, they sought to impose their authority on the Swiss lands, and the Swiss were not too happy about it. This was the time of the Swiss folk hero, William Tell. According to the story, the Austrian official in the town of Altdorf, Albrecht Gessler, placed his hat on a pole and ordered the town's folk to bow to it. William Tell, an expert with the crossbow, entered the town with his son and did not bow before the hat. Gessler condemned him to death, but offered him a chance of freedom if he could shoot an apple off his son's head. Amazingly, Tell shot the bolt and split the apple. Later on, he assassinated Gessler and cemented his legend as a hero to the people of Switzerland. The three teamed up Swiss cantons defeated the Austrians at the Battle of Morgarten, encouraging other Swiss cities to join them in the formation of what's called the Old Swiss Confederacy. The Swiss won another impressive victory at the Battle of Sempach and followed that up with another win. The Swiss soldiers with their pikes and halberds earned a formidable reputation as first-rate fighters of exceptional ability. However, further Swiss territorial ambitions were quashed in 1515 after the French Venetian victory at Marignano. Thereafter, the Swiss mostly busied themselves within their own borders and quite a bit of drama was going on there. When the German monk Martin Luther dared to challenge the edicts of the Roman Catholic Church, the ripples of his Protestant Reformation extended over much of Europe, including Switzerland. Switzerland, and it began in Switzerland because of sausages. What? Yes, sausages. Smoked sausages. In Zurich in 1522, a man ate sausages during Lent when eating meat is forbidden, and he was arrested. A pastor named Huldrich Zwingli defended him, arguing Lent was not commanded in the Bible and that abstaining from meat should be voluntary, not enforced. Several Swiss regions adopted Protestantism. Others were determined to remain Catholic. Zwingli was killed in battle against a much larger Catholic force, who burned his body as a heretic. He was succeeded by Heinrich Bullinger, who worked together with with the famous French theologian John Calvin. Calvin settled himself in the city-state of Geneva, where he welcomed English Protestants fleeing the persecution of the Catholic Queen Bloody Mary. With the Swiss lands already bitterly divided, they had no interest in exacerbating the division, and thus were neutral during the Thirty Years' War. As that conflict subsided, this Swiss diplomat succeeded in negotiating independence for Switzerland from the Holy Roman Empire. High taxes sparked a peasant revolt, and Catholics and Protestants continued to fight, Catholics winning the First War, the Protestants winning the Second. Which which led to Protestants receiving equal treatment before the law in Catholic regions. And judging from this painting, the Pope was so upset he lifted his hand up a bit. Now after the French overthrew their monarchy in their revolution, they invaded Switzerland and dismantled the old Swiss Confederacy, refashioning it as the Helvetic Republic, named after the ancient Celtic tribe the Helveti, remember them? Rage and unrest erupted under the French occupation, and it was Napoleon who later oversaw the restoration of Swiss self-rule. This state lasted until Napoleon's downfall, when full independence was 
regained, and the European powers accepted Switzerland's policy of official neutrality. But there was still plenty of internal agitation within Switzerland, as the disrupted system and conflicting ambitions for governance and order boiled up into skirmishes and actual civil war, though thankfully it was only a short one. After this, Switzerland received a federal constitution and a central government, thus ending the long tradition of the country being a loose bundle of autonomous states, though each canton was to have representatives in a system that emulated that of the United States. Now having reached this point, it's important to highlight that Switzerland by this time had established itself as a major banking center, a masterful manufacturing hub, especially famed for its watches, and, most importantly of all, a prominent producer of chocolate. It was the Swiss who pioneered the idea of adding milk to chocolate to make milk chocolate, thus giving it that silky, smooth texture of scrumptious deliciousness you love so much. And you too! Yes, me too. As much of Europe would grunt and sweat under the weary burden of war, Switzerland enjoyed peace and devoted its energies to building and industrializing. Now, in 1859, a Swiss Calvinist businessman named Henri Dunant was traveling through Italy and witnessed the aftermath of the Battle of Solferino. He was shocked and horrified at the sight. 40,000 men dead or wounded and writhing in pain, with essentially no one tending to them. He immediately set about organizing the locals to care for the injured men, and thus was the beginning of the humanitarian Red Cross organization, and the Geneva Conventions, international treaties and protocols outlining the rights of military personnel, prisoners, and civilians in wartime. Dunant was the recipient of the very first Nobel Peace Prize. Switzerland stuck by its policy of armed neutrality during both world wars, and while it was surrounded by Axis-controlled territory, the Germans never invaded. The Swiss economy grew substantially during the Cold War, though it did not join either NATO or the EU, and the country became the headquarters of several major institutions such as the World Health Organization and the World Trade Organization, the World Economic Forum, and CERN. Switzerland today is one of the safest and richest nations in the world, and possesses one of the highest levels of human development and quality of life, and has given the world brilliant achievements in the realms of science, art, sport, and literature. And chocolate? Yes, and chocolate. I like chocolate. That's nice. Anyway, that's it for Switzerland, and that's all from me for now. Bye-bye!